Yeah, good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. I'm just so used to saying good morning, everyone. Uh, again, for some people, it's morning. I don't know if it's morning for you, then good morning. Uh, but uh, thanks all for joining us uh, on today's Lunch and Learn. So just a reminder, today's Lunch and Learn is sponsored by our, our good friend uh, and uh, community member, uh, uh, Gary and Nancy Perlman. We're very thankful for their uh, generosity in sponsoring today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, it's sponsored in honor of Robert Fish, uh, myself, and, and uh, everything that uh, is going on in town. So uh, we are very humbled and, and grateful for that sponsorship uh, in our honor. So today's Lunch to Learn is a very important topic. It's something very crucial to our development, very crucial to our understanding of some complicated things that might be going on in our lives complicated things that might, we might view it through uh, Judaism, uh, through history, uh, and through stories that have, uh, that we've seen in the Torah, right? I, I, I'm just giving that introduction because I think it's something very important to realize that the topic that we're talking about today, right, is something that really spans um, all different parts of our existence in this world, uh, from our Judaism to our day-to-day -day life, uh, from uh, politics, to spirituality, uh, to uh, our relationship with our kids, uh, to uh, our, our understanding of different stories in the Torah. Now, what is this topic that we're talking about? We're talking about conflicts. Ah, and here we go. The food is here. I start and the food is coming. Okay. Um, yeah, if you could just put it over there. Oh, that's fine. People can just take themselves. Okay, yeah, people, I think everybody's comfortable yeah, taking themselves. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is about contradictions in our lives, right? Contradictions in our lives is constantly something that's happening all the time, right? If you look at the first source, and, and I apologize, um, next time I will, um, I, I could, again, if anybody wants the sources, please email me and I'll be happy to send it to you, right? We live in a world of contradiction. Most of them are, are most of them created by ourselves. Why do, why do we do that, that exactly? If, we find your, if you find yourself in a category, what values do you get from it? We live in a world of contradiction, right? Things that are constantly being contradicted, right? And a lot of times we do it ourselves. So just for an example, right? Uh, if you think about it for a second, right? Uh, you want to go buy a car, right? I want, right? I'm in the car business. I mean, not in the car business. I'm in the car buying business, right? Let's just rephrase, right? I don't have a side hustle that, uh, you know, I'm making a lot of money. Right. Um, so I'm in the business. I'm right now looking for a car. Right. And what, what am I looking for? I really want a, a mini SUV that I can fit my whole family in, which should be really a seven seater. Right? That I can have the car seat in all the time without any any problems. And that's what I'm looking for. It'll be nice to have low mileage. Right? Beautiful to have brand new. Right. But it'd be nice to have low mileage. It'd be nice to uh, for it to be, you know, a relatively uh the newer model, it'll be nice and if it'll be relatively in my price range, right? But all those things are really a contradiction, right? They're a conflict. It's having low mileage and having a, 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 a car automatically makes it that it's going to be a higher, right, price range. And it's not necessarily going to be in my price range. So we constantly make contradictions in our life. We're constantly having, now I have to decide what I want to do. Right? That's just a, a, a small a tiny little example that really doesn't make any difference. I mean, it makes a difference in my life what kind of car I'm getting, and that's why I still have my car, which actually right now I'm trying to get to 191919, right? I'm 191 uh, zero something, so I'm almost there. I need like another 700 miles, right? And so I don't know if I'm really willing to uh, up my car yet. Uh, please go ahead and go get some food. I'll continue talking, all right? But please go ahead, go ahead, go, go, go get some food. Guys, you know what? We're going to pause for a second. Everybody, we're pausing, all right? We're pausing, all right? Let's just pause for a second. Uh, people on the Zoom, please feel free to grab some food also in your office or in your house. All right? We don't want you guys to feel left out. Well, we'll give a, a, a two minute pause. Uh, and uh, anybody that will be listening to this afterwards knows that we stopped. Right? Um, but I don't want to stop the recording and then start again. Saying that was very recent. Okay, because I had emailed her a couple of times a long time ago. Yes. 
It's meat and rice. <laughs> this out there, next time if you want to come, we have meat and rice. To, not to make you jealous. Yeah. But. <laughs> No, I'm good. I'll eat afterwards, but thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thanks for the information. Thanks for that. Or at least in advance. Okay. Well, wait one more minute. Okay, so we're going to continue. All right, so as we said, contradictions in our lives right, it happens all the time. The question is, when you associate the word contradiction, right, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? All right, so sometimes something negative, right? Some, it's a negative thing. Oxford trade lists the following synonym for the contradiction. When you type in contradiction, right, and you have synonyms, different things that come next to contradiction, what comes up? It's conflict, it's clash, disagreement, opposition, right? Uh, mismatch, and other negative, sort of negative words, right? Uh, that's, that's a conflict in classes and then this is, uh, right? Uh, opposition, right? That is uh, typically when we think of contradiction, right? We think of something in a negative. It's a negative view of it. That's what contradiction seems to be. The question is, is it negative? But is contradiction something that is negative? That is what I want to talk about today, right? Do we find, and we're not regarding in the English language, I did not major in English, so forget that, right? Um, but right, when we think about contradiction, as we said, our, our initial uh, you know, uh, reaction is, right? It's something negative, right? But the, the, the things like this, right? And uh, this is where we are really digging into it. And as I said, from the stories of our patriarchs and matriarchs, the Torah, we find in this week's Torah portion, and not only in this week's Torah portion, but we're going to talk about the stories in this week's Torah portion, all right? But it's going to be a, a little insight to other stories in the Torah, other halachas, other laws in the Torah. But we find in this week's Torah portion, we find uh, seemingly many contradictions in this week's Torah portion. We find in this week's Torah portion things that seem that they're contradicting each other. It, it's, it's just something hard to comprehend, something that's like, what's going on over here? And, and I'm just going to talk about two of them, right? Actually, um, three of them, right? We're going to talk about three of them in this week's Torah portion, but this is just an insight into other uh, stories, other, other things that might, might happen, right? Uh, and, and again, as we, we're going to explain these ones, right? But this is going to give us a little insight into what are we really supposed to do with the concept of contradiction in our lives. This is hopefully will help us in our general life. Right, but to realize a contradiction is something that's not necessarily negative. Let's look at number one, the city of Sedan, right? This week's Torah portion, right? God tells the angels to go ahead and destroy the city of Sedan, right? The city of Sedan. Now, before God tells the angels to destroy the city of Sedan, which is Saddam and Amora, right? What does God do? God says, uh -uh, I can't destroy it yet. You know why? Because I have to uh, speak to Abraham about it, right? I have to go ahead and ask Abraham, right? What does he think? Because Abraham is the father of all the nations, right? So Abraham, I need to go ahead and speak to Abraham. Now, let's just give a little insight for those that uh, just a quick refresher course of, uh, of uh, Hebrew school or day school or whatever it is, right? Or the weekly Torah parts. And the people of Sodom were not good people. It, it very lightly said they were not good people. Right, they were they they were mean. Right, they were they they were anti uh, anti anything that had to do with kindness and friendship. Right, they were self absorbed people. Uh, the, the the Talmud tells us, and the Madras tells us uh, of a famous story. 
of they caught a girl giving uh, a homeless person, a poor person, some food. So what they do, they hung her up in the Times in Times Square. I don't know if it was actually Times Square, but in the square, right? And they smeared her with honey, and they let a, a, a flock of bees go ahead and attack her. Right? The the pain and the suffering just because someone helps someone else out. It was against the laws to help other people out. Now we're the people of Sodom. That's who we're dealing with. Now we're dealing with people that are, 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 are aggressive. And we find that when, uh, just like uh, when uh, Lot had the angels, he didn't know his angels, he thought it was strangers, right? In his house, the people of Sodom came and rioted. They said, give us these people. You can't have strangers in your house. You can't do hospitality. Right? These are the people that we're dealing with. Right? To the core, they were mean, they were terrible, they were, they were, they were just the, the bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the worst of the worst. And what does Abraham do? Right? Abraham and God tells him, hey, I want to destroy the people. So don't. What could have Abraham done? Abraham could have said, oh, perfect, great. Right? Thank God, right? rooting out the evil. Right? I've been preaching my whole life of doing kindness and helping people. And I have a tent of uh, that took down the doors of four, four, all four sides. I didn't want someone to go around. I want everybody to feel comfortable. Right? Avram is the epitome of the opposite of the people of Sodom. So he should have said, great, awesome. What does Avram do? Avram prays for them. Avram says, oh, maybe there's uh, 50 rights. Maybe there's 40, maybe there's 30, maybe there's 35. Right? Are you going to kill the righteous with the evil? Avram goes and bats for them. At the end, right? He doesn't, he can't find, he can't win out. But he went and bat for them. Question is, what's going on over here? Right? Why did Avram go ahead and bat for them? Right? Why do you want to save them? Right? Avram wasn't going to go ahead and kill them themselves. Right? But God is coming to them. Listen, these people are bad. I want to wipe them out. Right? Avram could have just kept his mouth shut. Okay, well, listen, I'm not. Who am I to argue with God? <laughs> who am I to argue with God? And Avram could have said, okay, I mean, they're, they're bad people. Okay, I hear that. Right? But no, he didn't keep quiet. Right? He didn't just say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to plead the fifth. Right? But he went and he went and batted for them. What's going on over here? It's seemingly a contradiction of, what's, of, of who he was. Right? Didn't he want the world to become safer, kinder, right? a place without the people of Sodom? That's one seemingly contradiction in this week's Torah portion, right? Something that seems to be a, 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 a conundrum of what's going on over here. Abraham Avinu, the epitome of chesed, the epitome of kindness of helping other people, right? and he's going to bat for the people that right? are the polar opposite with him. Now, we're not saying that he should go and fight them, right? but if God wants to destroy them. Go ahead. Who am I to say anything? Question number one. Question number two right, is that this is not so much a question, but something to analyze. And this is very important in the, the, the way the Torah is, is, it has to be learned, right? Uh, just, uh, the Torah is not a storybook. The Torah is not just a, a light reader to do, you know, uh, before you go to bed or sitting on your recliner, right? Um, the, the Torah is something that we have to learn. We have to study, right? And there's ways of learning and dissecting and growing and, 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 and learning the Torah properly. And this is something that we have a tradition and it's something that we know that when two things are put next to each other, there's a reason, there's a connection, there's something to learn from the connection of the two stories or two laws, right? Two things that are next to each other, there's a reason, even though chronologically, maybe this is how it went, but there could have been a different story that was put in between, a different thing that happened, right? There's a re rhyme and reason why two things are next to each other. So the question is, why are these two stories at the beginning of the Torah right next to each other? The first story is, Avram Avinu just had his brit meal at 99 years old. Ow. <laughs> right? He is hurting, right? No anesthesia, right? He is, you know, at the, just resting, trying to recover. And what's he doing? He's standing, it says Avram sitting at the Pesach Oel, the opening of the gate of his tent, because he's waiting for guests. Avram Avinu wants to have guests. What does God do? God sends the angels, right? And the story of the angels of Avram, right, Avram Avinu, right, hosting the guests and taking care of the guests. So we have this one story of, again, Avram Avinu, the epitome of chesed, right, standing out, waiting, even after he, he, he's in tremendous pain, right, pain that we cannot fathom, right, 
that, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and just rest. And he's old, he's, he's 99 years old, besides, you know, having surgery, right? He's 99 years old. No, I want to do chesed. And then right afterwards, what do we have? The story of the people of Sodom, the destruction of Sodom, right? What's the connection between the two stories, right? Why do we talk about the story of Abraham Right? And then the story of Sodom right next to each other. Yeah, it's not a tremendous conflict. It's not a conflict between two people. Like we asked with Abram, what was going on with Abram, one way or another. But in the Torah itself, why did it put these two conflicting, um, uh, you know, person, uh, conflicting uh, messages of someone that's the epitome of good right next to some, the people of, of the epitome of bad, right? And the destruction. And probably the biggest problem, the biggest the biggest conflict and the, the greatest question that we have to ask, and this is actually one of the biggest questions in the Torah, right? Maimonides speaks about it. The commentaries from all parts of the ages have speak about this, right? Is the end of this week's Torah portion speaks about the binding of Isaac, that Kedat Yitzchak, and the binding of Isaac. And this is something that in and itself has to be learned properly, right? The story itself has to be learned properly. It is, Part of our prayer on the high holidays, and right, that we invoke the Kedis Yitzchak in memory of Isaac and Abraham that went ahead and, and did this, this, this great thing. As in our history, it's considered a, a wonderful thing, the, 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 the loyalty to God. But if you break it down, right, there's really some major issues with this with the story. We have to understand, God forbid, seemingly major issues, not issues because it's the Torah and that's where we're going to come and explain, but seemingly major issues, major conflicts, right, and contradictions within the, 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 the people that are involved in the story. As we said, Avram Avinu was the epitome of chesed. Avram Avinu not only was the epitome of chesed, Avram Avinu was fighting his whole life to show people that God is kind. Right, Avram Avinu, as the Midrash tells us in the Torah, tells us one of his big fights that he was fighting against was idol worshiping. It was not just idol worshiping, but he was fighting against the idol worshippers that sacrificed their children to their gods. Right, that was a practice in those days. And as we find, the Torah prohibits it later on. When the Torah tells us about laws, one of the things it specifically sp speaks out is not to sacrifice your child to the Adomi, right, to that uh, Avodah and that's what Avram Avinu was preaching. And that was part of his whole thing. God is kind. God doesn't want us to hurt ourselves, right? God is, God, God is a, a God that wants us to grow and, 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 and become greater, right? And, and, and then he practiced that way. That was his whole thing of kindness. And that was Avram Avinu's words, Midas said the attribute of kindness, right? Yitzchak is Gavura, right? Isaac is Teferis, right? These different ones. But Avram Avinu is known as Chesed. So how the heck could he go ahead and slaughter his child? And how could God ask him to go ahead and slaughter his child? All right? God himself prohibits this kind of action. How could God go ahead right, and, and ask him right, to go ahead and slaughter his child? And we want to take it even more. Right? The whole history of the Jewish people was God promised Abraham that through Isaac, through Isaac, through Yitzchak, right, the Jewish people will be. Right? Originally, right, God told Abraham, you'll have to so said, it's fine, let Ishmael be my child. I had already Ismael. I said, no, 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 you're going to have another child. And that's where the angels in the beginning of the parsha came ahead and said, you're going to have a child with Sarah. Right? You're going to have Isaac. And before we have in the story, this week, Torah portion speaks about the story of Isaac. Again, the same story of Isaac being born. Right? And God tells him, this is your descendants. The Jewish people are going to come from here. And a mere couple of years later, right? What happens? Go ahead and kill your son. This son that I promised you that the Jewish people are going to come from. It's a contradiction. It's a, a, to the highest degree. What is going on here? And how can we go ahead and, and understand this? Right? And, and I just bold it. It's therefore all more surprising and it's shocking. It is in effect this story of the binding of Isaac on the altar of Mount Sinai, Mount Maria, sorry, completely negates the miracle of the birth of Isaac. The whole miracle, 
right? And what's the miracle of the birth of Isaac? The miracle of the birth of Isaac is that God shows kindness to Abraham and Isaac to Sarah, even though Sarah was barren, right? He showed kindness to them. He said, no, the Jewish people are going to come from here and that the Jewish people are a miracle people. Because look, they come from miracle. Isaac was born through a miracle, right? We find that also Jacob was born because Rebecca was also barren, right? So what is going on over here? How can we understand right, these stories? And what does it mean? As we said, again, contradiction over here seems to be something that this is a contradiction. This is something that seemingly is really struggling over here, right? What's going on over here? So if you turn the page, right? I found this online. I'm not sure, I didn't have a chance to Google who this is. Maybe some of you know who it is, right? It says like this. It used to be, I used to have, right, a negative connotation, right, for me too. He's, this is a continuation, Con, the concept of conflicts, right, the contradiction story. But lately, it evolved due to my activities as a scientist. And in science, as you know, a contradiction resolution is a primary activity. A contradiction between theory and exemption between different theories, between different ex experimental results, all have to be resolved. And each resolution brings a new result. And discovery. That is why my attitude to contradiction began to change from st straight evidence to active seeking and resolution. What does this mean? And, and we're going to come ahead and back to the story of, 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 our forefathers, of our forefathers, but I just want to bring out something. Why, of course, is an explanation. We're going to bring out the explanation of what's going on. Right, but why did God write it in this way? Why didn't it just say things clearly the way it's supposed to be? Right, because what is contradiction? Contradiction is not necessarily something that's negative. Yes, if someone's contradicting themselves and there's no reason for it, if I tell you, "Hey, right, you're a good guy," and then I turn around and say, "I'm a bad guy," right? So that's 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 contradiction. That's uh, that's that's not a good thing, right? And there are you no know, so your acts. Your actions are supposed to be in tune with what you say, right? There are, of course, contradictions that are bad. But just like everything in the world, there's something bad and but there's also good to everything. Maimonides says that every attribute, everything has right a good and a bad, except for haughtiness, gaiva, right? Stay far away from haughtiness. He said there's no good in haughtiness. Haughtiness, there's no such thing of a good haughtiness. It's called self-esteem, it's called self-assurance, but that's not haughtiness. And we gave a whole class we can a fine line between haughtiness, arrogance, and self-confidence, right? That's not today's discussion, right? But everything has something good from it. And so too, a contradiction, there's a goodness out of contradiction. What is that? And as he points out very nicely, when you have a contradiction of something, right, what do you have to do? You have to go ahead and dig deeper, right? You have two different results. You try to understand what's going on. And we saw, see this in, in conflict resolution a lot of times. You have two different people that have different opinions. You have, uh, I, I, let's go back to my, uh, my, my, uh, my dilemma of my car, right? Right, uh, I want uh, I want a SUV that fits seven, right? But not too big either. I want this big, humongous little big thing. I want like more of like a, a smaller one that you know the seat folds in the back, right? Uh, just FYI, this is what I'm looking for, guys. <laughs> right, uh, but uh, you know, and I don't. I want it to be lower mileage, but I don't want it to be too uh, too old, and I want it to. Be with... So what do I do? I sit down. I go through the papers. I say, okay, what am I? What 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 do I do over here? And I can't have all this, right? So, you know what, it's, I'll rather have, you know, a, a, a newer car with a little more mileage. Or I'll rather have a little lower mileage, but an older car, right? There, there is that way, right? Or, you know, let me, let me not the seven. So, okay, so if we, the whole family needs to go, we'll take the van and it won't take my car. But a five-seater is just fine because I could take the kid and still leave the car city because now my daughter's not here. She lives in, she lives in Miami and Hollywood now, right? So, you know, we could figure out, and, and I, I start, playing around and see what I could do and, and maneuvering different things. And I come out with a, with a conclusion. If I didn't have any of these contradictions, it's like, whatever, I would never come out to, to, to the resolution that I want or the resolution, not necessarily that I want, but the resolution that is practical, right? The resolution that is what I can do, what, what, what's possible, right? Just because I want something, that doesn't mean to say that it's practical. So the conflicts in me allow me to reach Right, a, a a resolution, right, to something that is attainable, something that's possible, right. Uh, just one more example. Let's consider parents, all right, child relationship, right. How do you want your ch child to be? What if your son or daughter, all right, contradicts you? What if your son and daughter never contradict you? Which one would you rather? 
Of course, we all are. It's so generic to contradict us. We don't want to have to have, uh, you know, to discipline them. Oh, my perfect mate alum, my perfect tire love, boy, uh, girl, whatever. Ah, perfect. But at the end of the day, you don't want that. You don't want that. It's all very nice and dandy when they're little kids and they, you don't have to run after them. You don't have to argue with them. You don't have to discipline them. You don't have to take their doors off their room. Right, go off of it, right? I actually did that once, right? Um, <laughs> oh, no, I'm okay. This is being recorded, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, you know. Um, but, you know, you don't want to have to do that, right? But let's be honest, right? We want them, right? On one hand, we want our children to be good citizens, to behave, to conform. On the other hand, we want them to stand up, to change the world for better, to be creative, and eventually move out of that, our house, right? That may be sooner. But no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> right? I love my kids, right? Um, but, but we want them to, we want it to be done with respect, and that's part of the conflict. The con we have to educate them. It has to be done with respect, right? I always tell my kids, you know, there's nothing wrong, nothing like, nothing wrong with a the, with the good question. Right, but it has to be done as a question, not as a statement, not as a conflict, not as an argument. It has to be done with the, with the, with the, with the, with the proper tone of voice. Right? There's, there, we want our kids not to conform. We want it to be conflict. We want it to be a little back and forth. We want them to struggle a little bit. We want them to have different opinions, different things. Because the only way to truly get to the high, to the to the to the real point of things, to truly dig deep and to truly uh, internalize and to understand what's going on and to come to a new understanding, is through a little conflict, with a little disagreement, with a little misunderstanding, with a little confusion. That's the only way to truly get to something. Because otherwise, we're just robots. Right? That's all we are. And as we said this many times. Right, the 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 famous story of the Talmud with Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, not Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, sorry, Rabbi Yochanan, not Rabbi Yochanan, but also named Rabbi Yochanan. Right, Rabbi Yochanan was a rabbi of the Talmud, right, and his study partner passed away, Rabbi Shlakis. So this, he he was missing his study partner. So the rabbis, right, from all rabbis gathered the greatest, his students gathered the rabbi, greatest rabbis of all time uh, of that era, and they found him a study partner. And said, oh, great study partner. They learned after a little while, they said, you're not for me. All right, I asked him, what's wrong? He said, let me tell you the difference. He said, when I learned, when I say a statement or I say a halakha or a law or something or explanation of the oral law, right? This rabbi, he's great. He knows everything, but he brings me 25 proofs, what I said. Excuse me, he brings me 25 proofs, what I said. He said, Rav Shlok, excuse me. He said, Rav Shlokish, when I would say something, he would ask me 25 questions. And from those 25 questions, now I have to go ahead and dig deeper and understand, right? And I have a little comfort in myself, right? I have to understand. I have to go ahead and struggle back more than I get 25 new answers. And I understand the Tom, I understand the, the, the Mishnah, I understand the oral law, I understand what's on a much deeper level. And I sometimes have a whole new perspective on things. I don't need someone just to conform, just bring me proofs. I need someone to ask me questions. I need someone to challenge me. I need someone to, to contradict me sometimes in a respectful way. I need someone to contradict me in order to get really deeper to what's going on. So this, my friends, is why the Torah is written sometimes in a cryptic way. There was a, uh, a, a couple articles written, right? and I don't have this written down over here, a couple articles written throughout the ages, primarily starting from the 1800s, right? Um, but that, that the Torah should not be looked at as factual. Torah should be looked at as a metaphor. Right? Why? God forbid. Right? But one of their big things is because if you look through the Torah, there's a lot of things that are con contradictory in each other. Right? Some of them, these stories that we have right now, right? And we find other stories in the Torah, right? That seemingly are, are contradictory. So therefore, we can take a literal, we have to look at everything as a, as a metaphor. And therefore, that started this movement of the Torah is not really written by God. And that allowed the whole reform movement to really progress to what it is today. But what's one of their core things is this. They couldn't understand why is the Torah written in a way sometimes that's a little cryptic? Why is the Torah written in, in, in sometimes in a way that seems like a contradiction? And in mean, this week's Torah portion, it has so many of them right, that it begs the question, what's going on over here? And why is it written this way? So number one, we're answering why is it written this way? 
Because God does not want us just to conform. God could have just written everything clear. He could have just downloaded everything to our heads, right? We could have been angels and robots and not have any conflict within ourselves, any struggles within ourselves, right? Contradictions within our actions to our viewpoints, to our understanding of how we do things. God could have created us that way, but no, we'd never grow. We'd never, we'd never transcend, transcend. We'd never become something bigger and better. God created us in a way that we have contradictions within ourselves. We are have conflicts. And the Torah is written in a way that we have to go ahead and dig deeper. We have to go ahead and ask a question. We have to go ahead and speak to our comment, look at our commentary. We have to go ahead and look at the Talmud, understand what's going on over here. That we could get a much deeper understanding of the stories. And through getting a deeper understanding of the stories or the halakha or the laws, that we can then internalize and become much greater and better people. That is why it's written that way. But not because it's a metaphor, it wasn't written by God. God, God forbid, on the contrary, right? There's proofs that's not our discussion. Again, of course it was written by God, right? But God wrote it this way for us to be able to, as a conflict resolution, to come to a greater understanding of what's going on. So now we have uh, 15 more minutes, right? Let's try to understand these stories themselves. And so we're taking this Parsha sort of and, and dissecting it and trying to understand these stories but this is something that we have to do on all different parshios, right? Other also things throughout history, things that have happened to us, right? Uh, and, 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 and different laws we might have uh, struggles with, right? Um, but we have to understand that they're all there for us to grow from. Some of them we might understand, some of them we might have a harder time to understand, right? Uh, some of them we might never understand, right? But we have to believe that God is doing that for us to go ahead and dig deeper. So let's uh, analyze some of the stories over here. So the first one, first explanation I want to give, we're going to give two different explanations. Right? And there's many others, many, many others. All right, the first one comes from Ramosha Feinstein. So Ramosha Feinstein says something very, very powerful. And let's read it together inside. Ramosha Feinstein says, right, while Abraham's kindness and care towards others were perhaps his most outstanding trait, which was still tempted by his uh, of, of moral obligation to follow the will of God. Be sure that people of Sodom were evil, but Avram, through there was still hope. Perhaps someday they would return around, right? His personal desire to live in a safe, kind world could not distract, distract him from the commitment to what he understood to be God's will. Ultimately, and this is the punchline, we'll expand on this. Ultimately, the Almighty wants even right, the evildoers to repent. We'll only remove them when all hope is lost. All right, so this explains the story of Sodom, right? This is not going to explain the story of, of, of the Akeda, right? but this explains the first question we ask. What is the connection between the people of Sodom and Avram, right? Why did Avram go ahead and back to the people of Sodom where it seemingly is not, literally the contrary to it? He should have just said, okay, evil good, life's good, move on, right? Because Avram Avinu is teaching us an important lesson. The Torah is telling us an important lesson that Avram Avinu realized. Why did God go ahead and ask Avram? Why did God go ahead and ask Abram? Abram, should, Abram? Abram, really, if you take this a step further, Abram asked himself a question. Why is God asking me? So God said, because I'm the father of all the nations, and this is my land, and therefore I'm asking permission. Really? God needs permission from Abraham? Right? God created all of us. God created the land. Right? Abraham Avinu, yes, he was the father of all the nations. Abraham, Abamon, Goim, that's what it means. Right? The, the father of all the nations of the world. Right? But at the same time, he wasn't, the Jewish people didn't conquer the land yet. So Avram Vino asked him, himself a question, why did God ask me? And he said, you know why God asked me? Because God is teaching me an important lesson. God is teaching me that he doesn't want us to give up on anybody until we exhausted all our abilities to transform, right? to repent, to change our ways. Therefore, Abram went ahead and what did he ask? He said, maybe there's 50 righteous people. In the merit of the 50 righteous people, what does it mean the merit of the 50 righteous people save everybody? Just save the 50 righteous people. No, because Abram is saying that if there's 50 righteous people there, they could go ahead and they could teach the people. They could go ahead and could create grassroots for the future, the generation, right? Start an underground res revolution within the people's zone. He said, no, there's not 50. How about 45? All the way up to 10, because if there was 10, a million of people, right, of the being able to learn, right, and uh, to create spirituality, and that will spread to the children, to the grandchildren, at least future generations, 
will be able to start an underground revolution of, of, of changing and there's hope for the future of repentance, God would have saved everybody even now for the ability to maybe change. And that's why Abraham would. Abraham said, right now, right, I am concerned about these people. I am concerned about these people, but I'm concerned about righteousness. Chesed is a form of righteousness, of doing, uh, chesed is, is righteousness, right? It's doing the right thing, right? Sadaka is, is, is the same word as, as, as uh, tzedek, it's, this is just justice, right? Doing the right thing. Right now, yes, it would be easier just to wipe them out. But that's not the lesson Abram was teaching us. And Abram understood that by God asking him, why is God asking me this question? So what the lesson that we're supposed to learn from is that Abram Vinu had this conflict. He had this struggle. He had a struggle. What, am I, what should I do? Right? But he realized by ask, God asking the question, God gave him the answer. I have to go ahead and find out if there's any hope for these people. God wanted me to go through this process Right, for me to learn and for us, all generations to learn, we never give up on anybody. Never give up on anybody. Everybody has an opportunity to change. Right? We never, never, ever to say, forget it. Person has no hope. We keep on trying. Yes, we have, we have only a certain amount of time during the day and a certain amount of energy. So we, 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 we gear it towards people that show more connection, right? And, and are more interactive, right? But always throw out there. Everybody's always welcome. And, and that's why the two stories are next to each other also, to show that this is what Avram really is all about. The attribute of Avram, of chesed, of kindness, of going out to, to, to greet people, and it's all from the same root of looking out for every individual of what their need is. Not what necessarily makes them feel good, but what their need is. So if it's uh, someone's need is to get food and someone else's need is to pray for them and to give them hope that they could change and they could better themselves, that's all part of the greater chesed. That's one idea. And that answers the first two questions. The second idea, it answers really all the questions. And it's such an important idea that we have to reflect on. Right. Um, I don't remember when the first time I, I heard this or saw it. I don't remember. Right. Um, but uh, sort of have been thinking about this idea for years. I'm not that old, I'm only 40, but for years, right, I've been thinking about this idea. And, and, and it's something that is so important uh, for us to comprehend. And it's such a crucial, um, uh, really, foundation of who we are. And, and that it goes like this. Right. What God, what God was doing when he asked Avram to offer up his son, who was not requesting a child sacrifice, but something quite different. He wanted Avram to reinforce within himself and for all generations that we do kindness not because we think it's right or morally correct. We do it because that's what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And let me expand on this. The, the idea of kindness the idea of doing good to other people is a little addictive to some people. Some people can't stand it. Some people can't stand it, give me away. Right? But other people, it's a little addictive because it makes, them, it makes them feel good. It's like other things make them feel good. And there's nothing wrong with them, that's great. But what was the attribute of Avram Chesed was rooted in because that's what God wanted him to do. Right? We know that Avram is a midah of chesed, midah of kindness, the highest level of kindness. Avram is also the father of monotheism, the father of, of, of bringing God into the world. What is the connection of those two things? Because when you truly believe in God, right, and when you truly believe that there's a higher power, and we're not the ones that are building and creating and doing whatever we need to do, but we believe that there's a higher power, we're just doing our effort. Right? We're doing our effort. We don't do our effort. God says, okay, might. I mean, sometimes God says, okay, you win the lottery. Right? I still try for that. Right? But, uh, but, and then I can really get the car I want. Right? Um, but, um, right? But, right? But, but we are doing our effort, but ultimately God is the one that decides what's going to be and what's not going to be. And then our whole attitude changes. 
our, our attitude of giving to other people, of course, it makes us feel good. And there's nothing wrong with making feel good, right? There's nothing wrong as the, the, the fascinating Vilna Gon, the Gon of Vilna. The Vilna Gon says, right, that even though when one is having a relationship with their spouse, right, one is doing a mitzvah, right, but one should enjoy themselves. It's an enjoyable act. There's nothing wrong with it. On the contrary, right? That's what Avram is preaching. That doing God's work is enjoyable. Doing God's work is something that is beneficial for all of us. And a lot of times we get a physical pleasure out of it. There's nothing wrong with it. We have to understand that we're doing it because of God wants us to do it. And we're doing chesed because God wants us to do it. That's why Pirkei Avos, ethics of our father, and I've said this many times, ethics of our father, right? The beginning of ethics of our father, the the, 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 the Mishnah, the, the, the oral part of the Torah that teaches us about how to interact with other people, right? What is moral? What, what's our moral compass, right? Wh- how are we supposed to think? How are we supposed to do? Starts off with Moshe Kibbal Torah from Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai, and it gives the whole Jewish liturgy until the Anshay Knesset Gadol, until the Great Assembly. And then also until Hillel, until Rabbi Akkadis, the author of the Mishnah. Why? It's not the beginning of the Mishnah, it's smack in the middle. So as we said many times, it's because the laws of Shabbos or making blessings over food that people can understand. If you believe in it, you believe that that's from God. But moral, compass, what we think, how we should react. Let's look at the professors, the university, the academia, right? what society thinks at the time. And he's saying, no, 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 our moral standards, what we do, how we interact with people, Right, is based and rooted in the Torah. Because that's something that's rooted. That's something that has a that's something that has a a, 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 a finite uh, uh, an understanding. And sometimes we understand it, sometimes we need to look deeper into why God wants us to do that. But it's anchored in something. Something that's not anchored in anything, it all depends on how you feel. Therefore, the Germans may their name be cursed forever and ever, right? The Nazis necessarily the German people nowadays, right? But the Nazis, right? Hitler and those people, they cared about their dog. They wouldn't waste a bullet on their dog, right? They're fine people, but they were able to stoop to the low level of killing and torturing and gassing people, separating and ripping parents, children apart with their smile and their put together outfit and their moral compass because they felt that that was morally correct. They said these people are bad for the gene line or whatever. Because when we are not governed by something, right, it all depends on what we think and what we want. And God was teaching Avram and in the descendants forever. God said, I want to prove for eternity, forever, that Avram Avinu is doing kindness and chesed because of his relationship with me and proving it to Avram himself that it's because of the relationship with me not because you think it's good or bad. So what? How, I can, how can I test something like that? Or tell them to do another kind thing? No, no, no. The way I could test that is by making the greatest oxymoron for Avram, the greatest conflict from Avram to have and see what he's going to do. So what did he do? He went and told Avram the thing that you've been preaching your whole life. Right? What I've been telling you to preach your whole life. What I wrote in the Torah that it's prohibited to do of not sacrificing your son to idol worshiping, a worshiper, to an idol, right? To, 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 to do an act that seemingly is immoral and corrupt. I'm telling you to go ahead and do that. What are you going to do? And Avram won the test. So that's why it was a final test. Avram said, I'm doing it. I do what God tells me to do. I didn't preach all that because I thought it was right. Of course, I think it's right because that's what God told me to do. But I preached all that because that's what God told me to do. And Abraham, God, of course, would never let that happen, right? And God stopped him. But he wanted to see if Abraham was going to go through it. And therefore, put he also the whole, he, that's why it's also connected to Isaac. It had to be Isaac because he wanted to see. Abraham could say, God, what are you doing, right? You told me that my descendants will come from Isaac. God, what are you doing? You told me not to sacrifice me. God, what are you doing? Right? This is like the meat of Saddam, who we were just discussing beforehand. Right? What are you telling me? No. God, Abraham accepted it. He realized that this was not the time to question. He realized God told him to do something that he can't comprehend. God didn't ask him a question. What am I going to do with the people of Saddam? 
where he opened up a conversation, now is the time to speak. God told him directly to do something. Now is the time to do. And to show that I'm doing everything because God told me to do. That is a lesson of the Akedah Yitzchak. That is why the Akedah Yitzchak is what we speak about, right? The sacrifice of Isaac is what we speak about on Rosh Hashanah, right? It's because this is the epitome lesson that we're supposed to learn that our ultimate relationship with God is listening to what God wants us to do. And not what we think is right or wrong. And that, my friends, is why the story of Sodom is also in this week's Torah portion. Because the people of Sodom were polar opposites of this. Right? The, Tom, the ethics of our father says that if someone says, shalish, shalish, shalach, shalach, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. That sounds like, okay, mine is mine and what's yours is yours. Right? Okay, you're not a righteous person, right? but you're okay person. That's one opinion. The other opinion is, you're like the people of Saddam and Amora. What? I'm not taking your stuff. If I say what's yours is mine, anyway, mine is mine. You're a bad person. Yeah, it's called the Russia, evil person. But when I say what's mine is mine and yours, you're the people of Saddam and Amora. I'm just like, yeah, I'm not a good person. I'm not a righteous person, but I'm a paid person. Why is it like the people of Saddam and Amora? And the commentary to say, because what does it mean? Well, how could someone say what's mine is mine with yours? Is what really is going on in the person's mind is because I created everything. I don't believe in a higher power. What's mine is mine. I worked hard for this, right? This is mine, right? It's my hard work and my toiling that created my, the, created my fortune. So why should you have it? Go ahead and work for yourself. What's yours is yours. I don't want your stuff because you worked hard for it. I'm good with that. I don't believe in a higher power. I don't believe in anybody helping. I don't believe in helping other people out. Not because I'm stingy, not because part of that comes in because this attitude of what's mine is mine. Right? What's mine is mine. And therefore, right, that is like the people of Sodom. Because what drove the people of Sodom to such acts is because they were on their own moral compass. They thought that they were being correct. They thought that they were doing justice. How can you give someone else stuff? Right? You work hard for it. it. Defies against what our logic is. Right? That's what they felt. Because they didn't have any God in them. The ain't no Lokai Bekirbi. There's no God in, in this land. And that's what Avram told Avimelech when he took Sarah. Right? Avimelech said, Why don't you tell me? He says, Because ain't no Kai There's no God. You have no, you're not God fear. Therefore, even though you're not like Mitraim, you're not mean and but. I couldn't tell you the truth because you would have found a way, your lust for Sarah would have found a way to make it that it was morally correct to kill me. Of course, you would have had to work with a moral compass. Egypt didn't have any moral compass. But you would have had to work with a moral compass because you don't have God. You don't have nothing anchoring you. That's the lesson that we're supposed to learn from these stories, right? From Abram, from the Akedah, right? And that's who we are. We are people that are governed by God. We struggle with it every day. We have our struggles and we have our challenges, but that's the root of where we come from. That's the lesson that we're supposed to learn from our Brahma So if we see something that's hard, we see horrific things that happen. Yes, we're supposed to question. We're supposed to discuss. We have supposed, but bottom line is we have to remember that the conflict resolution comes out to, we believe that God knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And we know, believe that God has a plan. Sometimes we understand it. Sometimes we don't. And sometimes we see a rebirth, an unbelievable thing that came out of something. Sometimes we don't. Maybe it could be years from now. It could be it's a, a whole different idea that God has. And sometimes the Torah tells us to do things that seemingly is against what the moral compass of this society is. But we have to remember that the moral compass of this society 20 years ago was different too. And then 20 years from now is going to be different too. And right? so it's constantly in flux, constantly changing. We are anchored by what God tells us to do because we are God-fearing people. Each one of us on our own level. We are governed by that. And that's the ultimate thing of Avram Vinu. Avram Vinu is a person that walked with God. One that recognized God. His chesed, his acts of kindness came from that. Not besides that. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Um, again, a big thank you to uh, Gary and Nancy Perlman for sponsoring. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the next Lunch to Learn. Um, and thank you for uh, the Allens for sponsoring that. The uh, flyer will come out uh, for the exact date and, um, and the, the name of the Lunch to Learn. Thanks all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you another time.